hope you're having a great time so far. Uh, so my name is Katya. Uh, originally I'm from here, I finished uh, Lviv Polytechnic University. And uh, after that, in 2012, I joined Prezi as a software engineer. And uh, here is my colleague Patty. Uh, he's hiding there. Uh, he, he is actually the employee number one at Prezi, and he, is, uh, he, he built or made a foundation for almost every system we have now. And uh, we want to talk to you about uh, cross-platform development at Prezi. And, uh, more specifically, our journey here and the uh, steps we took in multi-platform. And uh, we will focus uh, how did we end up writing C++ code for various mobile and desktop platforms. And um, how do we do it? So um, to give you more of a context, uh, Prezi is a software presentation tool. Uh, this presentation is actually made in Prezi. Like, what a surprise. And, uh, Everything started with this great idea to create a spatial zoom in canvas for various kinds of objects. And uh, first it was implemented in Flash. And uh, it, it was meant for browsers uh, which support the Flash player. And the uh, idea was actually successful because by the end of the year we, have, we had 885,000 uh, registered users. And uh, next year, we actually took the first uh, steps into multi-platform because uh, we introduced some Mac and Windows desktop clients. And basically, it was the same Flash application, just wrapped into Air application. And we also introduced features like uh, collaborative editing and uh, PPT import. And uh, the year 2011, uh, we introduced our first iPad version and uh, also first native OpenGL render, and uh, it was purely implemented in Objective-C. And uh, 2012, here we initiated a few multi-platform projects, and uh, Patty will tell you how and uh, why did we do it. So welcome, Patty. Thank you, Katya. So as you can see, uh, by this time, we already had a multi-platform application. So let's see uh, first, why do you want to do something like this? Uh, if you want uh, a multi-platform application, always ask yourself first uh, if this is something you really want to do or not, uh, because there are always pros and cons for this. Uh, you should check how many platforms you want to be on, how complex your code base is, uh, what are the performance requirements, uh, how many code you can share. Because, uh, for example, if you only have uh, two applications and they are pretty simple, maybe you don't have to complicate uh, the whole code base and you can only uh, just write both from scratch. Next. Uh, what does this mean for us? Uh, as you can see, this is a, this is a zooming canvas, and uh, we would like to uh, see the same picture on all the platforms, so we would like to have a pixel-perfect rendering across all the platforms. And second, uh, it's also nice to share some code. Uh, we had already issues like uh, we forget to update something in one platform, and uh, then we had some bugs and prior ones, uh, so it's nice to share some code. Uh, if you decided that you want to go multi-platform, uh, the question is how you can do it. Uh, either you do something uh, totally from scratch on, on all the platforms, uh, what we did so far, uh, or you just write a single application, a single code that uh, runs on all the, all the platforms. Usually, it's better to have something in between. Uh, also, on the other axis, you can see that uh, you can go fully native, or you can fi find some solution to, to run that code in a VM that is available on all the platforms. This way, you truly have a, a single cross-platform uh, solution, but uh, this also has some drawbacks. We went with this solution for the first time. We were using uh, Hex. I don't know how many of you heard about Hex. One, two, okay. So this is a this is a source to source compiler uh, based on ECMAScript uh, and outputs Flash, uh, JavaScript, C++, and some other uh, languages. Uh, it was quite 
good for us for the first time because uh, it targeted uh, all the all the platforms we wanted. But uh, because uh, it was it is based on ECMAScript, uh, we had performance issues as well uh, because for the native code this means that you need to implement a garbage collector, and also it was uh, meant mainly for writing the whole application uh, from scratch in, in Hex. Uh, it was quite hard to, to mix it with already existing applications. Uh, that's why we thought again what we can do, and we came to the conclusion that we have, we have actually a VM available on all the platforms. Uh, it is called the browser. And uh, so let's, why not use JavaScript? JavaScript uh, is available in the browser, and uh, there are also uh, engines you can use if, there, if you want to have a if you want to have a native application. You can embed the V8 or other uh, engines into your applications. But uh, this time we also had uh, issues mainly on on iPad on iOS uh, because of of the performance. Uh, all of the uh, VMs available on on, uh, on iOS, and iOS itself doesn't support JIT compiling uh, because of security reasons, and uh, the code was really, really slow. Uh, so we were thinking again, we ditched this idea that we can have something uh, general, single code base uh, shared across all the platforms, but the, let me just uh, explain a, a specific problem we had. Uh, during next year. Uh, this is again about pixel perfect rendering and uh, especially for the text. You can see here these two characters. Uh, I put uh, two words inside. Uh, our users like to do something like this. Uh, so it's nice, I can zoom on it. But on the other platform, what happened here? Uh, that's because uh, the size of the text was one pixel longer on this platform, but the text box itself had the same size, so there w was a word wrap made, and now it totally looks different because of that single pixel difference, and uh, because of zooming, this is amplified. <coughs> Our solution for this uh, now we started from C++. Uh, there is an open source library called uh, HarvBuzz. Um, it implements one part of a text rendering stack. It tells you where you have to put your characters. Uh, we compiled this uh, with MScript then uh, to, C uh, to JavaScript. And then we used Hex uh, to implement uh, the text box, editable text box on top of this. And uh, with Hex, we, we output C++, JavaScript, and Flash code. And we had a, a text box now that looked the same on every, every platform. So what are we doing this year? As you can see, uh, we, we selected two platforms. We realized that, uh, that we, we cannot do something that is shared across all the platforms, so we said that, okay, let's use JavaScript in the browser and C++ plus uh, platform-specific implementation on all the native platforms. <coughs> Why did we choose C++ first? Uh, as I said multiple times, the zooming canvas, uh, the pixel differences, it has to be fast. It also has uh, requirements uh, for for resource handling that is quite different from if you, are, if you only have a, a static HTML uh, non-zooming non page. Because if you are zooming into a picture, you need a much, differ, a much higher resolution picture. And, uh, it, and on a mobile, you have limited memory, so you have to deal with this problem somehow. Uh, also, C++ is scalable for us as is Java, but uh, not JavaScript. Um, it's a static language, so it's, it's always good to have some uh, security nest behind of you. 
And thirdly, it also gives us the freedom and the different options. Uh, sometimes we want fast code, sometimes we want secure code, so you can always choose uh, depending on, on the specific problem what you want. Uh, next to C++, uh, we are using uh, the platform SDKs because uh, we, we, we want the, the applications to look and behave as a native, native applications. Uh, the UI, the whole experience should be, should be native, but, but the user expects on a, on a specific platform. How we did this? We went with this uh, view model idea that uh, the common code uh, exposes a view model and some services for you, and uh, you can interact with this uh, from the platform specific application. I call this a uh, sandwich architecture because uh, as you can see on the bottom and the top is the, is the platform specific application. On the top is the, is the UI and all the platform specific features. And on the bottom, for example, we have network uh, implementation. That's because uh, most of, uh, of, the, of, the, of these platforms ha have a pretty good uh, network layer with all the features already available, so it doesn't really make sense to, to implement this in a, in, a, in a common way. So we just expose this through a, a, a common API. On top of this, we have the, the native OS, uh, whatever it exposes, OpenGL, and so on. We have a, a common engine uh, that is application independent, and then on top of this, uh, we are implementing Right now, the viewer, the Prezi viewer application, but uh, we could just put something else on top as well. This means that uh, most of the controlling logic is in, 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 in the platform specific code, uh, and you have some parts that you have to re implement. But uh, you can also reverse the control, and this is what we didn't do yet, but we will try. Uh, that you have a view-specific interface. Let's say, put me this dialog up or open this sidebar for me. And uh, this is uh, written in C++, the interface, so you can have the, the controlling uh, there in the common code. And then you implement this uh, on every platform. What about C++ on Android? Uh, in the morning, you, I hope you already heard about Scavier, uh, how it works on Android, uh, with NDK and SDK and the JNI in between. Uh, NDK works pretty well for us. Um, I just highlight one issue here we had, uh, then, and that's uh, debugging and how you can interact with the, with the existing application. A solution for this uh, is that if you have a, a cross-platform code, then, then you, can, uh, you can develop it on, on desktop, debug it on desktop, and if it works well, then you can start integrating into, into Android. So how do we connect uh, these two sides? Because you have to connect, and not everything is available in the NDK. Uh, through JNI, and JNI, if you want to do it by hand, it's a, it's a pain in the ass, so I don't recommend to do that. Uh, you have solutions, different solutions for this problem, because a lot of people are facing this problem. So either you can, uh, you can generate the code from a DSL, and the most well-known solution for this is Swig, but uh, as I heard, Dropbox also came out with a solution lately for Java and Objective-C. And we also have a solution not for C++ and Android, but uh, it's, a, it's a really similar idea, idea for, uh, Java, for languages compiling to JavaScript. So we can connect them through a, a DSL and we generate the binding code from the DSL as well. Or you can go custom, and this is what we did because uh, it's more flexible. If you know and if you have some specific problems, then uh, then you can solve them more easily with a, with a custom solution. 
as I said, you can go fully manual, but I don't recommend it. And uh, what we did is, uh, is an embedded DSL-like solution. Uh, it's in C++, so you, you define the, the, the layout of your classes, your types in C++. And uh, yeah, let me show how it works. First, uh, if you want to expose a, a class, let's say, to Java in a same way as it is in C++, or so a similar way, then the main idea is usually that uh, you pass around uh, the memory address of the object you want to expose, and uh, you pass it back and forth from C++ to Java, and uh, you cast it back on the C++ side after you, uh, you, you called it from, from Java, and then you can call any method of, on it. Of course, you have to be careful because this is just a memory address. It can uh, go out of scope. You, then you have a dangling pointer and uh, nasty crashes. You have to be careful about this. <laughs> there is no automatic solution. For example, I used here a, a shared pointer that does uh, reference counting. So as long as it's kept on the, in the scope, then it, it, will be, it will be live and it will be fine to call it. Okay, uh, let's see a specific example. Here is this amazingly interesting class that can do bar and return foo, uh, no, the other way. You want to expose it in, in Java the same way with the same interface. You write your class outline, the native, uh, native methods, and you use the pointer uh, to return it to uh, C++. So this is how it looks uh, right now for us uh, on the C++ side. We are registering the, the JNI functions from C++, so we are not using the mangled name uh, generated by Java Age. And also we have this, uh, this is this EDSL I was talking about. We have this convenient uh, macro where you can just wrap any method inside. and. Uh, through templated functions, uh, this is the JNI function basically, uh, and this is a template function, and uh, it's instantiated with uh, all the different uh, methods that you are inputting, and through this, uh, you can deduce the the compiler can deduce the the arguments and the return times for the for the method itself, and based on that, uh, we can do the type conversion uh, from the C++ to the to the Java object. Uh, of course, this has some boilerplate code. Uh, the Java part has to be handwritten. The C++ has to be handwritten. Uh, the names of the of the native functions have to be matched. Uh, so our idea is to to generate this as well, and uh, to make it less less error prone than what we have today. <coughs> Okay, uh, so let's see how all this works uh, in practice during everyday uh, development and how do we de develop uh, this during daily life. So I want to start with the continuous integration. As uh, for us at Prez, it's very important that uh, your code can go to production as fast as possible. Um, but here we have few challenges on the mobile. Uh, bec for example, we have a few teams who are working on uh, independent uh, C++ libraries. And these uh, C++ libraries mainly communicate between uh, strictly defined API interfaces. And uh, we need a solution that would uh, help us to integrate these libraries together automatically. And then b through bindings to uh, can be automatically integrated into Java application or without bindings into iOS application and be deployed to devices. And another challenge is that while writing our C++ code, we do mine different target platforms and uh, different architectures. Uh, because even for Android, we, uh, we want to support x86 and IRAM. But while writing our code, uh, we don't want to run launch like 10 emulators and uh, see if code is running because our development environment is in OS 6 using Xcode. So the solution we found for us for both of these platforms uh, is a custom Gradle plugin. I guess, guys, you know about Gradle. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we, we know that this... Uh, 
uh, the solution is, uh, I mean, Gradle is mainly for GVM languages. And even at Gradleware, who is a producer of Gradle, they do admit that Prezi is going uh, where no one has gone, bef gone before. Because for us, Gradle not only generates dependencies, uh, not only resolve dependencies, but also using CMake, it uh, generates projects for us. And uh, then these projects could be used for building and testing uh, our source code. And uh, if everything succeeds on every platform, we um, we save these libraries into our external repository, and this process is uh, is uh, repeated. And uh, this could be done as uh, uh, during our local uh, development, and as well as by Jenkins, which can done it automatically for us for every platform. And here I wanted to uh, show an example of our flow. So this code is. Uh, uh, the source code is run automatically by Jenkins for every platform, and if everything succeeds, as you see, we publish an artifact. And uh, here are a few points that we work in different branches uh, because we don't want to fuck up the work of each other too much, and we merge to master only if pull requests from branches succeed. And uh, if you ask about testing, for C++ we only have unit tests, and for this we use uh, Google Test Framework. And this is uh, an example of uh, one of our real tests. And uh, other type of tests, like integration and functional tests, are uh, on platform. And here I wanted to show you an example of, uh, you know, for Android. So we have functional tests, and uh, they are implemented in Calabash. And uh, we mainly map the behavior of the user here. And uh, this is just a picture of our Jenkins slave, and the tests are run on a real uh, Samsung S4 device. And uh, integration tests are more interesting, I think. Uh, they also are run by Calabash and uh, also Espresso framework. And uh, here we uh, we can also map behavior of the user and uh, subscribe to events from uh, C++ libraries. And uh, with this, we can uh, build the performance tests. And here are example of, uh, uh, for example, we can, r by running automatically uh, Prezi on different presentations, we can see how every device and OS is performing. And uh, our product development is uh, also uh, quite uh, interesting, I think. Um, now we are testing the concept of a feature team. So our team is uh, responsible for delivering a feature uh, everywhere, like from uh, web apps to mobile and desktop. And here you can see a team structure. Uh, it's uh, fully cross-functional. And uh, as I said, for us, fast iterations are very important. So we want to go from ideas through prototype developments, testing, and to release very fast and even on a daily basis. So that's year 2014. And uh, now we actually have 47 million registered users. And uh, we expect to have a lot more with launching our uh, next projects, next uh, uh, products. And uh, uh, what's next now for us is actually we feel that our build system is uh, too complicated. We, uh, we want to find an uh, easier solution for us. Also, we are looking for something which would give us a possibility for easy debugging of C++ code on uh, uh, Android devices especially. And we want to build a sophisticated performance measurement system for mobile apps. Uh, we made a few steps here, but uh, we want to go further. And we want to introduce more feature teams, not uh, platform teams. And uh, that's about it. Oh, I think that... Yeah, <laughs> thank you very much, guys. Uh, now we are happy to answer your questions and check our jobs page because we are hiring.
Yeah, yeah, we tried it, uh, it works. Uh, what we didn't have uh, found a solution for yet is that uh, to have an integrated solution for both the, the Java and the C++ part. So you just fire up your application, you put breakpoints anywhere, you can see the code in, in one place, you don't have to switch back and forth. There are no initial, initialization issues like the native code, when is the native code running? We had issues about when to put the breakpoint there. It can be solved, but there is no, we couldn't find a, a really convenient solution for it that you don't have to, that is, is just works and without uh, any problems. Yes? Okay, so the question was about uh, if we test on specific, only a few specific uh, uh, devices or, or how do we, or, or do we cover uh, the whole range what we can with different OS versions and, and, and devices. Uh, as you saw, we have like four different uh, devices what we test uh, currently on. Um, we also try the emulator to use the different OS versions but uh, we had issues with the emulator because uh, the application is, uh, uses OpenGL and we had issues on, on Linux because our Jenkins slaves are running on EC2. Um, so we, we started to run emulators on, on uh, Mac mini nodes, but uh, this wasn't really scalable. So right now we are only using uh, uh, these few devices and, and then we will see what happens at the users. <laughs> yes? I would like to know the answer as well for this. <laughs> uh, we, we, for example, the, the, the flow for the whole Android application, it takes like 40 minutes or something like that for us. And uh, we didn't found a solution yet. Uh, we would like to use the emulator for this and, and use it on multiple nodes and then only uh, run the tests on the device during the night or, or something like that as, as a backup because because uh, the emulator could catch uh, most of the of the problems, but uh, no, no, I, sorry, I, I don't have a solution for this yet. Uh, so we are doing something every something new every year because uh, we realized that uh, the last solution wasn't good enough. So it's not because we want to do something new, but we want to find a, the good enough solution for for a problem. Um, the size of the teams, right? That we, uh, right now we have an Android team who is only uh, focusing on the Android application itself, the Android part itself. Uh, they are two people currently. We have an iOS team. Uh, they are like, uh, we already have an iOS app out there, so we have to maintain that. Uh, two people are working on that, and uh, we are trying to come up with the, with the next version, and also uh, th like three or four people are working on, on this new version. These are only developers, so not design person, UX persons. Uh, besides, for example, there is a team uh, who is doing the remote presentation part uh, between the different platforms. They have uh, an expert, 
uh, from every platform in the team. So there is an Android expert, iOS expert. And uh, I think that's, no, no, sorry. Uh, we have two more teams, uh, and they are also like five, five people. So all in all, for Android, iOS, uh, currently we have around, how many people? 15, 20, 15, 20. You had another question, right? Uh, that is, no, yeah. Uh, we aren't using it yet, but uh, we, we brought the, the rendering uh, engine in a way that, uh, that the, the, this layer is abs abstracted. So we plan to introduce uh, Direct3D because of Windows, but currently the Windows application is still using Air so, and, and Flash. Thank you.